are all very welcome at tonight's event, E-Commerce Success Secrets by Industry Insiders. I'd like to introduce you to Kumo's Managing Director, Kieran Bullard, who is first speaker up tonight. Good evening, everybody, and thanks a lot for coming this evening. Our theme tonight is E-Commerce Success Strategies. So what I'm going to talk you through is some of our experiences over the last 17 years of working with customers from different markets with different kinds of business needs and requirements um, and focusing on some of the core elements from mobile through to marketplaces and I'll touch on each of those areas. So I mean we're all aware of the statistics right and the market statistics in terms of how that growth is happening right now in the market. I feel with working with brands is an opportunity at the smallest level through to the largest level right whether it's looking at marketplaces and that representing 40% of the growth that's happening out there in the marketplaces or the phenomenal and incredible growth and success of the um, sales in singles day. I mean, the statistics are just phenomenal. In one second, there were over 175,000 uh, transactions in the first hour of singles day. And so the opportunity is vast and I'll try to you know, dig into some of the reasons why uh, brands are enjoying some of that success. And obviously looking at wor worldwide retail sales, it'll reach about 3.4 billion um, in the UK. So let's look at cloud and let's look at it a bit more closely and how that's changed in the dynamic of how we you know, look at our operations in terms of retail operations to drive that success globally um, with, with our brands and take those brands internationally. Looking at the comparison between on-premise uh, platforms which are where you install that platform physically on your own servers and looking at what, are, what is the market saying we should be doing, what is the market saying, uh, where, it's, where is it going. And if you look at the kind of Forrester reports, the Gartner statistics, all of the statistics that are out there, you'll see that 66% of e-commerce software spending by 2019 will be on SaaS and cloud. And that represents about 9.4 billion in spending pretty significant okay what so what are the differences right because you know I get this from customers a lot I don't really understand the terminology what is on premise what's in the cloud what are the differences between the two so look from our point of view we're obviously I'm a little bit biased in that we are a cloud uh, cloud commerce uh, platform but what we see from some of our customers who are moving from on premise to the cloud is that there's a huge reduction in TCO over the period of time TCO is the cost, the total cost of ownership over the project life cycle. So from literally, I, ha I want to take my brand online to growing and developing your revenue stream over that period of time. What are the costs from an operational point of view? What are the differences right between the two? Okay, and why should I choose cloud versus on-premise? And these are just some of the considerations I think that's important to share with you based on you know our experience, I'm sure experience that you guys have as well in terms of both brands and retailers choosing platforms and choosing uh, to, to work with different vendors. Um, but there are some of the experiences that we've had in, in converting customers and changing customers from on-premise to uh, in the cloud. Our vision and our goal is to democratize digital commerce. I don't believe that we should be charging a huge amount of cash for any brand to get access to the platform, okay, or to get access to digital commerce to showcase their products and to turbo boost sales, right? I don't believe in that model. And I think that model ultimately will end up being phased out. It should be about embracing brands, bringing them on our platform and having a shared success model on the brand side and on the, uh, on the platform side. And so that's very much our vision and mission is to democratize the market and simplify how we take a brand from here to here. Um, and I'll show some examples of that as we go forward. Kumo as a business was set up 17 years ago its heritage and, and you know where we were founded was in Italy, working with some of the big fashion brands. So we actually took Dolce Gabbana online, LVMH, back in the early 2000s. So we had that experience of Acqui de Parma, for example, Maserati, many, many international well-known brands who came from really offline experience to an online experience. And we were the first partners with them to bring them online. It's interesting how that kind of that parallel has happened in the market as well, where customers have said to us, we want to outsource everything, okay? Warehousing, logistics, customer care, the whole piece, okay? Please can you do that for me? One of our customers as well, as you'll see there is Havianas, okay, the flip-flop makers. 
big brand in the UK, sell, sell a lot in the UK, okay? And Javiana said, listen, we've got, we've got these flip-flops, please can you help us sell us, you know, in all these markets, provide the warehouses, provide everything, even down to merchandising the products on their store and providing the e-commerce manager within our business to do that for them. Interestingly, if you fast forward a few years, we're actually still doing that for a lot of brands. And that business was thought to have kind of died and is dying out as people become you know, more mature in the markets and in source. But actually, I think what's happened is a lot of customers have understood the complexity in some of those areas and said, actually, our core expertise is in the brand, is in selling our product, not in logistics, not in payments or not in customer care. Per se, so it's interesting that the market has kind of switched a little bit too. I, I feel, and that's the experience on day to day we feel working with customers. But our, our heritage, as I said, was in fashion. Since then, we've kind of moved. You'll see our new customers in Q3 there everybody from uh, Butler's Chocolate to luxury perfume brands like Sana Jardin um, and um, Denver Bikes and you know, many different types of brands across many different types of verticals, not just fashion, okay? And actually today, and you'll see in the press tomorrow, we're announcing a partnership with Jetstream, which takes all of our brands who are international to the Asia specific market um, and gives them access to 50 marketplaces. Those three brands that we're starting with uh, are Hummel, which a lot of people will know, Tens, uh, Gilda and Pearl, um, and um, so some great brands to start off with and literally taking their product and taking advantage of that Asia Pacific market by us doing everything for them, literally providing the warehousing, providing access to those 50 new marketplaces, because it isn't just about eBay and Amazon as we'll go into as we progress. One, one of the case studies, just to, sh to show you some examples, um, th this, this uh, is Islam, who are a leader in outdoor clothing. Um, and they switched to Kumo from Magento, actually. Um, and we actually got that store live within 12 weeks. And actually, two, we've actually three other e-stores that went live this week. We have Avoca, Butler's, and Sana Jardin as well. They all went live this week. They were all projects that started around you know, early August or late July through to now so it is possible and it isn't you know a myth that you can get this from here to here within a two to three month period and we did that with those brands and you can see those live sites um, and I encourage you to have a look at those e-shops um, but one of the big considerations for them was you know they were very much an Italian brand how do we take this brand internationally uh, we don't have any expertise and so by bringing them online, by taking advantage of the fact that it's a cloud platform, SEO, digital marketing, all the inherent benefits that that, bring, that brought, we actually started to see orders from more than 40 countries around the world. And they were super shocked and kind of delighted, obviously, that they, they started to open up the US market naturally through that. And that was through organic search. It was through you know, a much more available platform in terms of their products. And so we're happy to share all those case studies. They're on the Kumo.com website. You can you know, go to the site and have a look at many case studies from very different verticals. One of the other questions we get asked all the time within the Kumo platform, you can manage all sales channels. So whether it's in-store, sales through in-store, click and collect an omni-channel, or it's through marketplaces, or it's through your eShop, all of that is managed within our one platform. It's pretty unique, right, that we link directly to eBay and Amazon, and you can list your products. And so we get asked all the time, you look, guys, we have it, you know, what are the considerations here? We're a bit nervous about going on Amazon and eBay. Is that going to hemorrhage my core pricing, for example? How is my brand going to be represented? Is it going to commoditize my product? There are many, many considerations. But what's really compelling and you can't ignore is the size of the opportunity that is there and the size of the audience. OK, so how do we take advantage of that audience? Right. There's 40% of sales are coming from marketplaces. So it's here to stay and it's growing at a phenomenal rate. But I don't think it's just about eBay and Amazon. And eBay and Amazon are not always right for your brand. There could be niche marketplaces for boutique brands that work much better than selling on eBay and Amazon because it's a clouded environment, right? And it's difficult to get noticed on those platforms. Looking at the statistics, it's interesting to see you know, Amazon's net sales in 2016 were just over 136 billion, right? It's 175,000 transactions per second during the first hour of uh, 
it's a single stay in an Alibaba. And the audience is roughly about a billion use, a billion people are using the top four uh, marketplaces. So what are the things that our brands ask us when they're going on marketplaces? What are the things that are they're concerned about and how do you address those concerns? And these are just some of them by all means. It's not all of the considerations, but certainly there's a lot to, to think about here. OK, so my brand positioning. OK, if I put my if I'm a luxury brand and I position my brand on eBay and Amazon as an example, how is that going to affect my core pricing on my eShop? OK, is it going to affect it? Do I use it in, you know, to sell the same products that I use that I sell on my eShop? Our experience has been that with a lot of high-end fashion clients, for example, they at the start of the season will not sell a lot of their core products on their new season on marketplaces, but will use it as a way of selling the end of line stock. Because we're all aware, right, at the start of the season, it could be 100 quid for something. And at the, the end of the season, it's 50 euros. So the margin is squeezed, right? So how do I get rid of that stock and sell it at a reasonable margin in a fast enough period of time without hemorrhaging my core pricing. So there are many ways I think that marketplaces can be used to take advantage of that billion users who have huge purchase power to drive and accelerate your brand growth into new markets and international markets. I think one of the, the, the interesting things to look at actually as well is Google versus Amazon, okay? So what is happening? What are consumers doing and what is consumer behavior? How is that informing how we as vendors and brands and um, uh, retailers react to that, okay? It's interesting to see that about 50% of product ser searches all happen for directly from Amazon. So it's no longer necessarily Google. It's interesting to look at that in terms of consumer behavior and consumer patterns. If 50% of them are going specifically for product searches, then where, where, the other 50% that's happening on other search engines like Google, the majority of which is Google, right? What are they doing, you know? And it, it seems from the statistics, from looking at the patterns and the behaviors that people are going to Google to do more research. Um, and then they go on Amazon to pick a specific product, but they end up completing that journey through Amazon directly and not directly on the retail, on the, at the retailer's mm -hmm. e-shop, which is very interesting. And I think it's very, if you look at the correlation between, um, let's say, the, the multiples, okay, the big kind of um, FMCG brands, the, the, the big mm -hmm. uh, kind of supermarket chains, you know, <laughs> it started off with, you know, you'd have Kellogg's, Cornflakes, there on the shelf, okay? And that started to squeeze, you know, some of those brands, their margin was squeezed as multiples put more pressure. That multiple, one multiple might say, okay, well, listen, guys, why don't we just put our own brand up there? Okay, why don't we start to sell our own brand? And it's, it's kind of interesting that Amazon is going that route as well, as I'm sure you're all aware, right? If a, a brand is successful um, and sells a lot, they will look to replace it and buy it themselves, which you can understand, but there's, there's a bit of a warning sign there, I think, as well, um, in terms of retailers and brands and, and their strategy there. So, um, so it, it, it's an interesting um, period I think when we're looking at how Google and Amazon are impacting the change and the consumer behavior when it comes to shopping. This is one kind of example that I talked to earlier about how do I you know, really use marketplaces to take advantage of the opportunity. That example is Diodora, who are you know, a major manufacturer of trainers. Most people probably know them. Um, they are one of our customers and have been a customer of ours for nearly 10 years. And we, they, they use us to sell on marketplaces at the end of a season. So one of the things that they wanted to do was get rid of all of that stock. And so you'll see from the case study, which we've also published on the site, that we opened an eBay and Amazon account in 14 countries um, within two weeks. OK, so they had a real need within a short period of time to sell as much as they possibly can to get rid of their end of line stock. And so within the Kumo platform, you can manage all sales channels, right? Not just your eShop, but, but marketplaces as well. So because the products were already listed there within Kumo, we could simply turn on those um, 14 countries. 
And it meant from an order management point of view, he could see all the revenue flowing, he could see which sales channels the revenue was coming from, and he didn't have the complexity of worrying about managing those KPIs. It, it, it's interesting because I think it is a challenge, isn't it, in terms of trying to, how do you position your brand? How do you use it, to, use it to, to, to take advantage of that audience, right? The advantage of having one platform that manages all sales channels is you can allocate stock and control the stock. And if the stock is synchronized across all areas, right, whether that's a store, because a, a store is a warehouse as well, right? And, and particularly in fashion, we've dealt with a lot of the complexity there where you know you've 20 colors, 20 sizes, and you can't have all of that stock available in every store or in every warehouse, right? So synchronization of all stock is crucial when you're looking at selling on multiple sales channels and having that stock available within one system across all sales channels creates a massive opportunity to maximize selling your product and not hemorrhaging your margin. Moving on to mobile, and it's just, I think, interesting <laughs> to look at the correlation between the growth in the adoption of smartphones and the growth in the digital commerce and e-commerce market. If you look, there's a direct correlation um, between what's driving that sales. Um, and it, it, it's very interesting to see when you look at kind of, you know, what is the average order value um, on these devices? What's driving that average order value and what are the inhibitors and what are the drivers? You know, looking at the, the market and looking at some of our customers' behavior, we've, we've kind of access to all the analytics for all our customers to get informed data on, on, on the behaviors. And it's very interesting that whilst mobile is a critical and game changer in terms of driving sales going forward, it's not quite there yet, right, in terms of sales. And is that inhibited by the size of the screen? Is it the one-click checkout inhibitors that have been there up until now? What is, are, are, the, are the factors that are stopping that from happening? Clearly, from looking at some of those statistics, it would point to the fact that the screen size is definitely an inhibitor, okay? If you look at you know, the difference between a smartphone tablet. And just drilling down into that again, you know, who has, which, which kind of device has the highest conversion ratios, okay? And looking at it, the traditional desktop is still, still by far um, the, the place where people are converting higher, um, about four to 5%. Um, smartphone, about one and a half percent, okay? But I think that's changing. And uh, with now, obviously, the Amazon one click um, checkout, that patent is, is, is being contested and that's now available for many more vendors. And that's going to help drive and fuel, I think, um, a smoother process for checkout for uh, customers, both on mobile. And also when you look at the screen size and, and, and the adoption of new screen sizes by new manufacturers. Our brands, when we're, when we're working with them, here are the things that they're looking to consider. Here are the things the market's pointing to. Um, One-click checkout, a crucial component in trying to convert those sales from mobile, which is already a difficult channel to convert in. So it's a must-have, I think, going forward to simplify that process. Um, so responsive design, listen, I'm sure everyone is aware of that, right? It's got to be responsive. It's got to be holistic across all devices and all sales channels. We saw that with the Havianus example. Interestingly enough, we had a much higher conversion ratio when people, when we created an app versus the M site and the responsive site for Havianus than we did from the responsive version of the site. And the consumer kind of case studies and statistics would point to the fact that consumers do prefer apps and they do prefer to use apps. And in fact, 85% of consumers, there were two studies that we looked at, um, prefer apps. It's not saying that we all have to jump in and, and have apps, but, but certainly it, 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 the, the statistics would say that it is worth investing, it's worth looking at and investing in it. So the other thing that you know we look at then when we're looking at how do you future-proof the experience for the consumer and the digital commerce journey, and what are the considerations, right? By, more, by, by kind of 2018, uh, Gartner, Forrester, most of the industry analysts that are looking at this market are pointing to the fact that 50% of commerce sites will integrate technologies from over 15 different vendors. The, the whole concept here is that what we try to look at in, in our vision for the business is to bring in as many one-click integration partners. So what does that mean? That means when you use the Kumo platform and it's a cloud platform, 
you may use Ma MailChimp, for example, but you may, with other vendors, for example, you would have to pay for that integration. You don't, okay? These integrations are all already done within our platform. You literally can scroll down to one-click partners, put in your credentials, and it'll synchronize the data from all these partners into the Kumo platform. So it's pretty powerful, and it's why we won the Gartner Cool Vendor status in 2016, and we further embellished that by being in the Magic Quadrant for 2017 with Gartner. Um, so I think it just simplifies the process. It makes it easier. Uh, future proofs your business because as businesses change and whether it's artificial intelligence, mm -hmm. people buying through voice instead of search, our way of dealing with that is to bring in these partners in our ecosystem and let you guys choose which you feel is best across all the key verticals in, in digital commerce. Whether that's customer intelligence and bringing in rating systems to help SEO and to improve conversion ratios, which it does, um, or working with logistics partners or marketing partners. But yeah, I think, look, there's, there's an incredible opportunity, as we all know. I think it is about looking at all sales channels, trying to embrace those sales channels. And all sales channels may not be, you know, right for every brand, but certainly the opportunity when you look at a billion people using marketplaces, the click and collect market and how that's trying to drive and is driving footfall and driving purchase in store and, and, and incorporating all those sales channels into one unified approach is crucial and uh, it's crucial to both the consumer experience and also from an op operational management point of view. Mobile, clearly we're all aware that there, it isn't driving the conversions that we wanted to drive yet but certainly it's still representing of that 69 billion in the UK market, it represents about 23 billion of that 69. So it's not small, right? We're, we'd all like a piece of that. Thank you very much. So yeah, thanks very much for your time.